Good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord for the opportunity to gather at our Christmas feast we had here, enjoying together what a blessed time it was. I don't think we've ever had, since I've been here, as many people as we had. Um, great opportunity to share and celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth for sinners. This morning, um, I'm going to read a psalm as well as the verse. It's just Romans 9, 1 we're going to be looking at, and it's going to take us through the scriptures. Um, but Psalm 73 um, is very helpful in setting the tone for understanding our conscience. This sermon's title is, Wanted, Dead or Alive. Your conscience. So I'll be reading Psalm 73, which you can find on page 575 in our Pew Bibles. And if you're able, please stand. Surely God is good to Israel, for those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong and are free from common burdens to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore the people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free from care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I kept my heart pure, and I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted. And I... Good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord for the opportunity to gather at our Christmas feast we had here, enjoying together what a blessed time it was. I don't think we've ever had, since I've been here, as many people as we had. Um, great opportunity to share and celebrate coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth for sinners. This morning, um, I'm going to read a psalm as well as the verse. It's just Romans 9, 1 we're going to be looking at, and it's going to take us through the scriptures. Um, but Psalm 73 um, is very helpful in setting the tone for understanding our conscience. This sermon's title is Wanted, Dead, or Alive, Your Conscience. So I'll be reading Psalm 73, which you can find on page 575 in our Pew Bibles. And if you're able, please stand. Surely God is good to Israel, for those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. 
They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong and are free from common burdens to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore the people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free from care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I kept my heart pure, and I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply, until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. <clears throat> they are like a dream when no one wakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved, with my spirit embittered. I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing I desire beside you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Amen. Amen. Romans 9, verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. And God bless the reading of His Word to your soul. You may be seated. So this morning, I want to bring to you Some thoughts, some understandings about the conscience. I'm convinced that reading from God's Word, the conscience, our consciences collectively, as a nation, as a people, and even as a church, are deadened. And I'm here to help awaken them. And our pastor is here to help awaken them. I purposely strive, and I ask God to help me, to tear up your conscience, to shred your conscience, to poke your conscience, because that is the inner light that God has put in you. We are not made like animals. We are made in the image of God, and one of the great things that makes man man is the conscience. We can contemplate ourselves. We can contemplate our maker. We can contemplate a universe. We can consider things that have great importance to us. But you can't touch, taste, or feel. We have a world that's trying to trick us into thinking that everything that what we see is what's real. 
That's not true. And everybody knows it. You never measured a pound of love, a foot of justice, a weight of joy. It's, no, you did none of the things that make life truly <coughs> worth living, that give us true understanding in our lives, have anything to do with an empirical measurement. Peace, patience, joy, kindness, love. They're all intangibles, and they are only reconciled through the mind and through the arbitrator of the conscience, giving us the understanding of what is truly right and what is truly wrong. And that's the glory of God. God speaks to us right there. And if we'll have His Word and what He says, we will come to develop a more tender conscience. And, I'm, and I say this to you as someone who grew up as a pagan with a radically callous, hardened, seared, every form of locked up conscience that was dead as it could be. And it took the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to slash it, to slay it. Because the sword of the Spirit is powerful and sharp. And it can cut it to bits. Amen. And I praise Him for His mercy on me that way. Amen. And I pray that that sword is working still in my life. Cutting off the callousness of my heart and cutting off the callousness of yours. For we have been bound in this sin nature that we were born with. And this world is continually in its darkness trying to hide it. Trying to scratch it and make it callous and make it worse. But we will only know the true tenderness of God when we have that tender heart and the callousness of our conscience is removed. So let's start with the text. Paul gives us a very, very, very important understanding of how we deal with our conscience in this text. He says this, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. So, so often as, as we read the scripture, nothing is an island here. So what we're, what we're hearing is Paul is making an emphatic claim. I speak the truth in Christ. What is this truth? Well, it's going to be the first eight chapters of the book. But very, very importantly, he had just finished a very, very powerful thought. What we get out of verse 39 of chapter 8? And we know how the book of Romans goes. It's the greatest argument. If you read this book carefully, there is... God has answered any and every objection you could ever have to who He is Amen. in His character and nature and what He's done. Amen. I don't care what objection you have. It is answered in this book. Amen. It is solid, 100% pure truth of God. Amen. And He's bringing this to light. And He says this in chapter 8. We have the great conclusion of the matter. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he continues rolling with his mercies from heaven, his mercies from heaven, great purposes for our life. And he then says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, nor neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's no... you When you have been born again and He sent the Holy Spirit to indwell you, though you sin, He is faithful and just. And He will see it through in you. And that's His power. And He says to... Us. I speak the truth in Christ. This is what Christ has done. He's not going to run away from you though you sin. That sin is, is for the tender conscience, the tender heart is 
called to repent, to come back to God when we've been burdened, when we've known we've done wrong. God is merciful and he's saying, come my child, come to me. You who are heavy laden and burdened and I'm going to give you rest. Cast your cares upon me. Repent, confess your sin. For I'm gentle and humble of heart and you will find rest for your souls. Hallelujah. So he's speaking the truth in Christ. And he says, my conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. That is a very, very important picture for us to understand. That God confirms what we understand in our conscience through the Spirit, through the power of the Spirit. So, we need to know something about the Spirit's work for this and the power of this to be true. The truth comes from John chapter 14. Those who have your Bibles, follow me. John chapter 14, where Jesus says this. It's going to be verse 15, 16, and 17. Jesus speaking. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Forever. The Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept the spirit of truth. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. That is a very critical understanding of who the spirit is in our life and what he does. You see, your conscience is looking to determine what is right and wrong, what is true and false. And when we reconcile it through the Spirit of God, He's going to speak that truth. He's going to help us understand through His power, through His truth, we are going to understand right from wrong, good from evil. And as we heard in some of the worship, that we wouldn't be afraid of man by the power of that spirit and then be able to speak it. Not hold it under a bushel. That our light would shine in a dark world. Amen. If I were, if it were, and it gets even more powerful. Go to John 16, two more chapters forward. Verse 8. When he comes, Jesus again, speaking about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will prove this lost world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Very important points of what the Spirit teaches us. I have much more to say to you about this. More than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will what? <coughs> What's he going to do? He's going to guide you into all truth. You see, any lie, any misrepresentation is not of God. He is absolutely pure. 100% and absolute truth. There's, there's no falsehood in Him at all. That's why we can believe His promises. That's why our pastor has been talking about the promises of God. That you can bet your soul on it. Amen. You can
My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. So when we begin to consider God's ways, the great command for the Christian to love the Lord your God with everything you have and to love your neighbor as yourself. Is it true? The answer is, better be. The Holy Spirit in you is telling you it is because it agrees with what He says. And the Holy Spirit's going to confirm everything He said. And he's going to encourage you in everything He said. He's going to teach you all this truth. And God is calling us to be the light, to be the understanding in a lost and dark world that can't understand. They can't tell you any truth. They can't. Amen. They can give you a set of facts that are observable, measurable. So what? Anyone could do we, That's meaningless. What is important are the matters of the heart. The matters of the heart are going to bring your soul peace. God speaks peace from His Word and we receive it and we understand it through our mind into our heart. There's a... Maybe a year ago I had the privilege of seeing it before you and I told you the heart will never exalt what your mind is rejecting. If your mind is rejecting the truth about God, if there's some sort of doctrine or some sort of understanding from the truth of God, what He said, if, you're, if your mind is rejecting it, you can never exalt in it in your heart. You don't believe it. There's where the church comes in. It's where pastors and elders, we call upon the body, brothers, how do we understand? What does this mean? Help me. And the body loves the Word of God, loves to come together to do these works mercy and encouragement. So, we have this arbiter that's in our minds and we've got the Spirit of God in our souls, in us. And our conscience is not first. It's God who's first. It's the Holy Spirit of God who's first. So, there are so many scriptures that talk about conscience and matters of conscience. We could never get through them all. But I want to bring to mind maybe one or two. Bad conscience. Who had a bad conscience? How about Judas Iscariot? He betrays the Lord of glory for 30 pieces of silver. His conscience was so burdened that he hung himself. He was so overwhelmed with worldly sorrow, not repentance back to God. But his conscience was so strong, he put a rope around his neck and hung himself. That's a burdened conscience. That's a weighted conscience. How about Joseph's brothers? They go down to Egypt for food. Joseph holds one of his brothers back. And what do they cry out? Twenty some odd years later, their conscience was still railing against their souls. We are being, this is because of what we did to our brother. Their consciences were burdened. And if we will grow in the tender mercies of our God, we will find that there are still areas of deadened conscience in our souls, in our hearts that need to be flipped over. The light of the gospel needs to shine upon them so that we don't carry the guilt, the burden, and the shame. God does not want us there. He wants the liberty that's found in Jesus Christ to be overwhelming your soul in every area of your life. He's calling all of us to confess. 
He's calling all of us to search our hearts and to bring to remembrance the sins of our youth. Think about it for a minute. The sins of your youth. The sins of my youth. I'm convinced God doesn't show them all to me at one time. I dropped dead of a heart attack. He peels that away and he shows me. And he shows me and he shows me. I encourage all of us to seek him that way. That he would do that for us. That he would continue to reveal himself in us. Allowing us to come to that deeper understanding of, 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 of what he's done for us. So God alone is Lord of the conscience. He is Lord of our conscience. Because He's the one that made it. And He's the one that put it there. Man has sought divisive ways. We have a world that's plagued with all sorts of devices that are trying to kill your conscience. Drugs, alcohol, pornography, slothfulness. Just take about any sin. Take about any sin we read in the scriptures. They're all designed by this world to help to deaden your conscience. And God is calling us out of that. Because we are, we are that specially made creation of God. That's the heart of the matter. Being made in the image of God. He put that in us. And that conscience is our teacher in a lot of ways. It's our guide. It's our helper that the Holy Spirit is using to bring this understanding, these, these, these determinations of how we deal with the things that we see in our life. When... Our consciences become more enlightened because they're, they, we're dealing with them. The tenderness is developed. And we begin to see a deeper understanding of how wicked sin is. That's one of the results of having that growing tender conscience. Understanding what God has done. A faithful conscience will seek after that rigorously. A dysfunctional conscience will ultimately have misunderstandings of God. A doubting conscience will flee from God, will... Not have confidence. A scrupulous conscience seeks greater light from God's word. An unfaithful conscience will allow you to be led wherever the world allows it to be led. So, in our conscience, our conscience speaks through the truth of Christ and is firm, it's confirmed in the Holy Spirit. So one of the main things that God wants for His children that's understood by and through our conscience is salvation. First and foremost. <coughs> is God speaking peace to your soul through your conscience? Do you have peace with God this morning? If you don't, and your conscience is pricked in any way, I encourage you to seek His face. You see, we all have an understanding of justice in our souls, and it's arbitrated by our conscience. It's the determiner of what's right and what's wrong. When you hear of a heinous crime, vile, perhaps some assault on a child and 
Something vicious happens to them. And the police track down the guilty party and then catch him. Your soul rejoices. It rejoices because right has been done. We can say yes, guilty, get them, absolutely. That innate sense of justice is in all of us. God left it in us as part of his character and nature. Though perverted by the fall, he left it in all of man. So that conscience is the one that understands that we have sinned. We have broken the commands of God. And we, we use, we talk about this verse from Job, I think even last week, that though I have broken his commands, through faith in Jesus Christ, I am not going to get what I deserve. That's a mercy from God. Our conscience, understanding by faith, the power of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus Christ was put upon that cross for your sin. He was crushed and He was killed for your sin and for my sin. And for all who put their faith in Him, he, you are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and you now have peace with God. When you repent of your wicked ways, what wicked ways? The wicked ways your conscience is confirming that have been wrong before God. The light of God showing you who you are. I don't know if some theologian in the past said this, but this is a very helpful thought. The greatest knowledge you could ever have is the knowledge of God who He is in His holiness and His character and His nature and all that He is and the knowledge of yourself. To see yourself the way God sees you. Not the way your mom, not the way your whoever in your life, your whoever's in your... No, 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 no. What does God see? You see, God sees everything. There's nowhere you can go to escape. There's nowhere you can turn where... God doesn't see you. He knows every word, deed, thought, and action. There's nothing that escapes His sight. So He calls us to confess. When we have stumbled before Him, when our conscience has burdened us that we have broken His will and His way. And that... I say to those here today who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ to understand that you have a misery right now of broken relationships, of, of not having peace in your life, but this is nothing compared to when you meet God. The wrath of God will be upon you and it will be a fierce day. There's hope. Amen. There's hope for sinners. There's hope for better things. And that comes through peace, through Jesus Christ, through repentance and faith in what He's done on that cross. So I encourage all of us to resolve this trouble of sin that we have in our life. To Allow the Holy Spirit to arbitrate through our conscience what is right and what is wrong. Understanding what God has said. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Has God always been number one in your life? I can go through the entire Decalogue and every one of those Pictures of how we are to love God and how we are to love the, uh, our neighbor. How do we love man? We've broken them all. He calls us to confess and repent and turn. And our conscience convicting us, convincing us that we have broken his ways. I'm going over the same thing. But he is holy, he is righteous, and he is merciful. Turn to him. Even for the believer, turn again this day. It's not like I've done this once and I'm all set. 
That's, that's not the life of the Christian. It's the continual turning. I, I, I'm going a direction in my life, and I'm, I'm still turning toward God. I'm still turning toward that light. <clears throat> so, by way of encouragement, for the Christian, for the seasoned believer in Jesus Christ, develop a strong conscience. Obey God. Look to find Him in His Word and the things that He has said. And go deeper in your faith by obeying God, by doing His will, by showing yourself approved to the things that He has said. Strong conscience is one that's well taught, well taught from the Word. I'm going to talk a little bit about that a little bit more. It's active in assessing all parts of life, and people that are given over to the Word of God will listen to it and will obey it. Strong men and women of God are sensitive to doing what's right and avoiding what is wrong. They'll be very opinionated against evil. They're not afraid to call evil, evil. God gave us this as our daily companion, by the way, part of the Holy Spirit. It's not just, like, it's partial. That your conscience is with you all the time. It's a consistent, consistently going on. Consistently arbitrating in our lives. So our consciences can be informed. The Word of God teaches us that also. Our consciences are informed. Our consciences can be seared. And I think we've all had seared conscience in some way. You know, you gotta think of it like this: that our life in Christ, okay, is like looking at a diamond. And when a diamond is mined out of the ground, it looks just like a chunk of something. And it takes a skilled craftsman to work upon that diamond and to make that cut upon it and to polish it. And that's maybe one picture, one understanding of God. And then that diamond is then cut until it begins to have a luster and shine with brilliance to see the glory of God. And some parts of the diamond that we're looking at aren't that yet. On one side of it, the things that we are active in, the things that God has gifted us in, we are, we are loving the Lord, we're loving our neighbor in these particular ways, and, and God's doing a mighty work, and we're rejoicing in Him, and we see the brilliance of God. And in other ways, I'm telling you, we need to seek God in, a, in, a, in ways that we hadn't before. We, we, we all stumble in many ways. And that's the hearkening of the church. For brothers and sisters coming together, loving each other, helping each other, not pointing a finger, not trying to, 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 to judge what you're dealing with, but to encourage, to lift up the body so that we would all grow in the faith. For who are you to judge God's servants? They're going to stand or fall before God Almighty. He's their judge, not me. And the flip side of that is we need to live in such a way that we don't act as though someone else is our Holy Spirit. Try to impart to them and do the will of God for them. Impossible. Okay. So, we have strong consciences. We need to be able to deal with what is going on in the body, it's very, very important. Because ultimately, there are things that we as a church believe. And we talked a little bit about this in Bible study this morning. For the, there's a few people there. But my prayer for us as a body this year is that we would grow in the unity and the strength of the Faith and conviction that we have. 
Okay? By definition, this church is an evangelical Baptist church. And I'm not going to get into all the theological things right here. If anyone's interested, we could talk about that. But there are, there are distinctions that are made, and that's who we were historically. So nothing's changed in any way. I, I, I'm just bringing to, 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 to light the, the fact that the, that's who we are. And I think what happens, that if our consciences aren't bound together, loving together, encouraging together, we hear things out there in the culture, in the Christendom, right? And those things begin to affect us. And they sound good. But ultimately, are the truth. And each church has doctrine. That doctrine is going to help us discern how we deal with things. Many of us, I've been to, into Pentecostal churches. I love my Pentecostal brothers. Like you guys have heard me say that many, many times. It's different. Their doctrine's different. Their theology is different. Matter of fact, if you try to mix it with the doctrine of this church, it doesn't mix. It's oil and water. Because you've got conflicting understandings of how we interpret God's Word. And by the way, you're going to find that with with fundamentalism, um, with even Presbyterians, with Lutherans, with Catholics, all these major denominations, and many of them are brothers. Don't hear me wrong on this. I, I, we love people that believe on the primary doctrines of Jesus Christ. You must be born again. You, you must repent and believe that right, we, we understand it, the basics of the gospel. But this is going farther. Because I'm convinced we get twisted up. We get our conscience. We're trying to understand these things. And when they don't come together and create this picture that God wants for us to have peace and understanding in our life, both now, but from our salvation to the way we live to what's going to happen when we die. What does that look like? It's, it, the, the theology creates that that straight, that linear understanding. And if you went to the, 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 the buffet of Christianity and you had a thing and you put a block of this and a lot, it, it doesn't get you there. You're, you're going to be all banged up and, you, and your soul isn't going to be satisfied. So the conscience is going to arbitrate these things. Are what we are saying from this pulpit is it true? Your conscience has to confirm it in the Holy Spirit. Very, very important. I want to bring up one matter of conscience, okay? And it's this idea that there is, and this is a, it's a, it's a Catholic doctrine, but it's, a, it's, a, it's something called implicit faith. Implicit faith. And I know there's a lot of people in our congregation <laughs> that were Catholic at one point, okay? <laughs> but implicit faith is the idea of agreeing with a set of facts about God, and somehow you're in the kingdom. I've been guilty of that. At one point in my walk with Jesus Christ, I thought that there was just some sort of agreement I had to, like somehow I had to approve what God did. <coughs> okay? When the fact of the matter is He is sovereign, and I have to believe what He has said. He doesn't have to approve what I say, okay? But what, I'm, what, I, what I see is that, and, and, I'm, and I'm convinced, I have people in my life, and I'm sure you do too, that somehow they've believed some, you know, six or eight things about Jesus, and they're okay with God. They are not. The Bible teaches us this, and I, I could give you a hundred, but we'd be here all afternoon. Uh, that is not true. Matter of fact, it's, 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 it's a lie of the devil trying to lull people's consciences to be just quiet enough that they're not concerned about their soul anymore. But God can save them. He could. They're, they're almost Christians, probably. They're probably close. 
They're probably seeking truth. But maybe God's calling one of us to go and speak that truth into their life. Maybe he's calling us to bring that gospel to bear upon their soul. Not just in word, but in deed and action. When love comes from our lips, our hands, and all that we do. So there's a matter of conscience. And if I would go, we were to go in the scriptures, I can bring you many, many matters of conscience. I'll bring one more. It's going to be out of uh, Romans chapter. We did it again this morning. I'll just touch on it. In Romans chapter 14. And again, this, it just gets too out uh, there. Just, just, just bear with me. Uh, it's Romans 14, verse 5. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. I'll just, we'll just use those few verses. One person considers one day more sacred than another. And another considers every day alike. Who's right? Who's right? Well, each of them must be fully convinced in their own mind. Their conscience must not be in disagreement with them. And these are going to be the matters that are not the primary matters of faith. Jesus Christ died for our sins. There, there's no other, all the elements of the truth, the primary causes of our faith and salvation, there, there's no negotiating there. But when it comes to how do you deal with this? Well, here's the thing. I'm in the camp that every day is alike. You know why? Because for me, every day is a Sabbath day rest in the Lord. That's how I understand that. Every day for me is, is rejoicing in the Lord. Every day is a day of walk. It's a special day to be with the brethren, to be part of the, the command to come together as God's church to worship and praise Him. But I worship and praise God every day. Amen. I thank Him for His mercies upon my soul. Amen. Okay? So we all have to deal. We've got to deal with this. We all have got, There's hundreds and hundreds of issues every day we deal with. And when it comes, we must be grace-filled to help each other through these matters. Very, very important point. So, with that said, I want to uh, encourage us um, in this coming year to have the gospel as our center, our conscience, guiding us by the Spirit in all that we do. Because we've got to understand, ultimately, the divine effect of the gospel in our lives it's by faith to purify your life. It's to purify your actions. It's to change your heart. It's to remedy your corruptions. It's to straighten out your distortions. It's to affect our corrupt natures. And having our souls commune with the living God for all of His incredible blessings, for peace in our conscience, for holiness in our life, and understanding that there is an eternity waiting for every soul here. Heaven awaits the child of God where pain, sin, death, disease, heartache, trouble, and, dis and destruction that's going on in our lives will be wiped away, Amen. and we will be in the presence of God and each other for all eternity. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for so great a mercy and salvation upon our souls, Lord, the privilege of being called your children, the privilege, Lord, of you giving us this radical truth of who you are and what you've done, Lord, being made in your image, Lord, being set apart from your creation by the conscience that we can contemplate you and each other, Lord, we praise you, Lord, for all your mighty work, Lord, praise your holy name, in Jesus' name, amen.